are uh, all here, I assume, because uh, you want to uh, be involved in Kiruv in some way. But there are conditions how that's possible, as Rabbi Bloom hinted to at the end that uh, Orla Gola was created to give one the tools to be able to uh, be a person who's involved in Kiruv. The Mishnah gives certain other conditions that have to be fulfilled before you can be Makarov people. Hillel Omer, Hevi mi Talmid of Shalaron, Ohev Shalom, the Rodev Shalom, Ohev Sabrios, and only after all of that, Mekarvin la Torah. And then you could be Makarov. First, you have to be a Talmud of Aaron, you have to be an Ohev Shalom, and a Rodev Shalom and an oe vesabrios. I thought it would be a good idea to explain what those conditions are in order that you should be able to fulfill the end of that Mishnah of Mikarvan la Torah. Also, why do you have to be a Talmud of Aaron? Hillel just sort of said, you should be oev shalom and rodev shalom, and oevis abrios, and then you can make our people a Torah. Why do you have to be a Talmud of Aaron? Well, the answer is that there are many ways of being an oev shalom and a rodev shalom and an oevis abrios. But you need to be a Talmud of Aaron to know how to do those things properly and how to approach them properly because all of those things can be distorted. Aaron was a Kohen Godel. Now, Kohen Godel could have been called Kohen Haroshi, Kohen Harosh. Why Kohen Godel? Aaron was Zoche to the title Godel. Moshe Rabbeinu also was Zoche to the title of Godel. How many blood Gemara do you have to learn to be called a Godel? In the world we live in today, all you have to do is be Bar Mitzvah and then you're a Ready a God. <laughs> Always like to say at the bris, we say Zeha Kotten Godel Yiyah. By the Bar Mitzvah, I think we should say Zeha Godel Godel Yiyah. <laughs> but what do you need to be called a Godel? So the Torah tells us specifically why Moshe Rabbeinu was called a Godel. Torah says, Vayigdal Hayeled, Moshe grew, and the next Pasuk says, Vayigdal Moshe. The first one, he grew physically. The second one, he grew and was fit to be called an Adam Godel. What gave him that privilege? Vayetse el Echo Vayar Besivlosa. And Rashi says, Nosan Einov the Libo Leos Meitzer Alehim. When Moshe Rabbeinu was no say Baal, he was able to empathize, much more than that also, with Klal Yisrael. Then he became a Godel. Aaron a Kohen. Kohen Godel, Lamaisa, feels that he is part and parcel of every Jew. And therefore, he can go into the Kodesh HaKadoshim and Yom Kippur and represent every single Jew. He can be Misvada and the Sir HaLazazel as a representative of all of Cloud Yisrael. That's a God. Why? Why is that designation? Nosan Eino Velibo Leos Meitzer Alehem. Why does that make you a God? Rav Shimon Shkop, that's all, in the Hakdama to Shara Yosha asked the following question. On the one hand, the Torah says that a person has to worry about himself. Not only worry about himself, 
But self-concern is the paramount concern a person has to have. You always come first. If you have an animal that's running away, and your Rebbe has an animal that's running away, and your father has an animal running away, and you can only save one of them, you save your own. That's halacha. If it's a question between your Rebbe and your father, and you're taken care of, then they're shilas. But if you're, you come first. You have money, and you need it. And there are other people who need it. You come first. Efes lo yebecho evyom. You have a canteen of water. And if you drink it, you'll get through the desert and survive. If you give it to your friend, he'll get through the desert and survive. If you share it, both of you will die in the desert. What's the halacha? You take it. Chayecha kodmin. You come first. So self-concern is a very legitimate concern according to the Torah. And yet... We have a responsibility to be concerned about others too. So how do we resolve the conflict between self-concern and, self and concern about others? It's a big conflict. Says Roshimin, it depends how you look at other people. If you look at yourself, that's you. And everybody else, that's someone else, then it's a big conflict. But there are some people who are bigger than that. And they consider their spouse part and parcel of themselves. Ishto kigufo, baal ki ishto. Mamish one. As they say that Ravari Levine once took his wife to the doctor. She had some kind of pain in her leg. And the doctor asked Ravari, what is the problem? He said, my wife's leg hurts us. That's a person who feels that his spouse is mamish part of him. So when he's concerned about his spouse or her spouse, he's not concerned about someone else, he's concerned about himself. That's self-concern. Except his concern is for two bodies that make up himself. Some people are bigger than that. And they understand their children, pro, pro, kara, davuo. Their children are extension of them. So when they're concerned about their children, they're concerned about themselves, except now themselves is a lot of bodies. Some people understand that their entire extended family is part of them. Uncles, aunts, cousins. So when they're concerned about their family, they're concerned about themselves. And some people understand their entire neighborhood, their entire city, entire country, the entire Klal Yisrael are also part of them. So then there's no conflict between self-concern and concern for others. It's all self-concern. Then the problem is only the priority of which part of me now I have to prioritize. And if that sounds like semantics, still me or those other people, it's not. The Chedushi Arim asked the following question. Yaakov Avinu wants to find a stone to rest his head on. And 12 stones are arguing, So what does the Rabbanu Shalom do? He makes a nace, and he fuses all the stones together. Says the Chdush Yarim, why did that solve the problem? Yaakov Avinu's head didn't get any bigger, and the stones didn't get any smaller. So you, now you have one gigantic stone that's 12 times the size of Yaakov's head. His head's only going to be on one twelfth of the stone. Why aren't the different parts of the stone arguing on which part is Yaakov going to put his head? Says the as long as they were separate stones, it made a difference. But once it's one unified stone, whether it's on this part of the stone or that part of the stone, made no difference anymore. When you consider other people, other people, and me is me, from my head to my toes, and that's it, then there's a very big conflict between me or them. But when it's all me, it's just different parts of me, then the conflict becomes very, very much minimal. So that is a godl. A godl 
is someone who encompasses all of cloud Israel or all of the world. And a very small person, a cotton, is a person who only considers himself part of himself. And everybody else is somebody else out there. Rabbi Shimon says that's the meaning of another Mishnah that Hillel said. It may not nearly mealy. If I don't worry about myself, who's going to worry about myself? I have to have self-concern. But Kisha Anili asks me when my Ani is just little me from my head to my toes. Mo Ani, that's not my Ani. My Ani has to encompass everyone. And then I have to really be concerned about me. But me is all of Cloud Yisrael. I think there's a hint in the word Ani itself to this idea. Ani is comprised of three letters, an Aleph, a Nun, and a Yud. The Aleph represents the individual. The Yud represents a minion, a tzibur, everybody else, the community. How do you take the individual and the community and unite them into your Ani with a Nun? The Nun represents Hamishim Sharei Bina and Hamishim Sharei Tara, like Rashi says. In order to be that Godel, who feels that someone else is mamish part of them. You need Eina Velibo. You need eyes, you need brains. You need Seichel. If all you have is emotion, then you may feel other people's needs, but you may not understand what they are and you may distort them. So you need more than just a lathe. You need Einayim. You need eyes, you need Seichel to know how to take care of other people's needs and what their needs really are. But if you only have eyes and only have seicho, then you'll write studies about poverty and about kiruv, but you'll never get involved because you don't have a heart, because you don't feel anything. So in order to be that real godel, you have to have a nayim and a lev, seicho and regish and emotion. Those are the 50 gates of Bina and the 50 gates of Tahara. If you have that Nun, then you can combine the Aleph of the individual and the Yod of the Tzibur and make that your Ani. That is an Odom Godel. That is Aaron Cohen Godel. That is Moshe Rabbeinu, who is an Odom Godel. So first, you have to be a Talmud of Aaron. Before you can start with Oev Shalom and Rodev Shalom and Oevis Habrios, because first you need a Seichel, and first you need to feel heart wise connected to other people, and Seichel wise to know how to be connected to other people. And then you can start the process that ends in Makarvan Latoda. What is that process? First thing is Oev Shalom. Love, peace. That doesn't mean that you love sitting in a lounge chair, sipping your lemonade and having a peaceful, serene time. That's not what shalom is. That's not gonna lead you to do anything, surely not be makar of other people. So what does it mean, oh, have shalom? Joy, peace, serenity. It's not what shalom means. Shalom means shlemus, perfection. You love the concept of perfection. You're put in this world to reach as much perfection as you can to be like the Rabbana Shalom. And you love, you have a connection. Love means a connection to something. You have a tremendous connection and a desire for Shlemus. Now what is Shlemus? Shlemus is not the domain of any individual. Shlemus is a group effort. There is nothing in this world. Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu is perfect. Everything else in this world is imperfect. And in order to reach perfection, needs to have a group effort with other things, and it's on all levels. The most simple physical level. The Svarno says, 
that the first six days of creation, the Rabbon Hashem looked at what he made and he said, it's good. Vayar Elohim Kitov. On Friday, after he finished everything, he gave it one look and it says, Vayar Elohim es kol asher osa v'hinei tov ma'od. HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw all the things that he created and they were very good. Says the Svarno, what transformed all these many good things into something very good? There's a lot of good things now. Why is it very good? To illustrate what the Svarno says, I'll give you an example. Take an automobile and break it down into its components. Where I live, they do that often. So now you have all the parts of an automobile strewn out on your lawn. You have tires, you have a gas tank, you have spark plugs, you have a horn, you have the seats. Each one has a function. You can use the seats as furniture, you can use the spark plugs to make a fire, you can use the gas tank to store liquids, you can use the horn for a musical instrument. It's all good. It all has a function. But when you put them all together and they create a functioning automobile, that's very good. The automobile is better than the sum of its parts. So too says the Svarno. When each thing was created in itself was good, but when it all was put together to be a functioning universe, that's very good. So perfection can only be reached to be like the Rabbonus almost perfect with a group effort. No one thing in this world can ever be perfect. It has to be a group effort in order to reach perfection. That's on the physical level, social level. If everybody in this world would be doctors, we'd have a very healthy world. But who would take out the garbage? And if everybody were garbage men, we'd have a very clean world, but who would heal the sick? So in order for the world to be as perfect as possible, you need all the various occupations and each one contributes his unique part towards the common good, and that's how the world reaches perfection. But it doesn't end on the physical and social level. It also applies to the spiritual level, too. We pride ourselves that we received the Torah with 613 mitzvahs. Perfection is being Mekayim, 613 mitzvahs. There's no one in this world who could ever fulfill 613 mitzvahs. Not because it's too hard, it's impossible. Because there are certain mitzvahs that are only for Kohanim. So if you're not a Kohen, forget it. You're out of the, out of the race. Okay, so you'll tell me Kohanim have 613 mitzvahs. No. There are certain mitzvahs that are only for non-Kohanim. If you're a Kohen, you'll never fulfill the mitzvah of Pidyan Aben as a father. You're exempt from it. So Kohanim have mitzvahs that no non-Kohen has, and non-Kohanim have mitzvahs that no Kohen has. Men have mitzvahs that no woman could ever do. No matter what kind of feminist she is or whatever, their mitzvahs are impossible for a woman to do. She can wrap tefillin on her head, she can sing to the, her kishkas out on Rosh Chodesh, but there are certain mitzvahs that are impossible for a woman to do. And there are certain mitzvahs that are impossible for a man to do. In my lifetime, I'm hoping that no man will ever bring the sacrifice after childbirth. <laughs> it is a uh, woman's mitzvah. So, unless you are a man, woman, Kohen, Levi, Israel, all wrapped into one, which under normal circumstances was not possible, today may be possible, You can't have 613 mitzvahs. So what is this myth of 613 mitzvahs? The answer is we didn't receive the Torah as individuals. We received the Torah as a conglomerate called Klal Yisrael. And Klal Yisrael has 613 mitzvahs. Some have this part, some have this part. Together, we have 613 mitzvahs. That's shlemus. That's perfection on all levels, physical, social, spiritual. 
And the truth is, that's what we say when we greet each other. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. We're using God's name. God's name is Shalom because he is the ultimate Shlemus. And this was instituted to use God's name when greeting someone by Boaz and his Beisdin. Boaz greeted his, his harvesters and he said to them, Hashem imachem, and they answered, Yevarechecha Hashem. So why this Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom, what does it mean? And the Maral says that somebody who initiates that greeting of Shalom Aleichem is a sign of tremendous humility. What's the humility? Now, when you say to someone, Shalom Aleichem, you're saying the following. My Shlemus and my connection to the Rabboni Shalom, which is my connection to perfection, depends on you. I can't do it myself. Shalom, my perfection is Aleichem, depends on you. Now, if the other person would answer, Shalom Aleichem, just like ping pong. No, 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 my perfection depends on you. and Just bantering it back and forth. So the second person says, you're right, your perfection depends on me, but aleichem ha-shalom, but my perfection also depends on you. I accept what you're saying, I'm not throwing it back at you, but I'm reciprocating by the fact that my perfection also depends on you. When was this instituted? In the time of Boaz, when the Sefer in Novi says, in those generations, everybody did what was good in their own eyes. If it's good for me, that's enough to be good. And Boaz wanted people to know you can't only concern yourself about yourself, but your perfection depends on others. And if it's not good for someone else, maybe it's not good for you either. So you can't do you have to be able to take other people in consideration because your perfection depends on them also. So first you have to be an Ohev Shalom. Before you can get involved in Kiruv, you have to learn from Aaron HaKohen how to be an Ohev Shalom, what it means to love peace, not to love being peaceful and serene. It means you love perfection. And you want to seek perfection for yourself and for others because you're an Adam Godel, like the Kohen Godel, that your perfection depends on others too. And if others are incomplete, then you're incomplete. And then there's a second condition, Rodev Shalom. Now, there are two meanings, I think, to Rodev Shalom. One is, you can be an Ohev Shalom. I really love the concept of perfection, write chaburas about it, right? really understand it in all of its depth, but it's only theoretical. Yiddishkeit is not theoretical, it's Lamaisa. If you're an Oev Shalom, you have to be a Rodev Shalom. Pursue it, do something. Marosh Shiva, Rav Gifter Zatzal, said in this week's Sedra, the daughters of Tzlafchad, come with a uh, good time. They want to inherit their father's uh, nachla since there are no sons. Before Moshe Rabbeinu, or before the Rabbon Shalom answers their question halachically, he says a preface. Cain beno slav chadovros. They're saying something substantial. Our Shiva learned from that that if somebody does something good, you just can't stand on the sidelines and say, great, you have to get involved. Give them some strength. Give them a yashikoach. Kein benoslav chadovros. Be involved. I always say that's shot in the Gemara. The Gemara says, Hanehena misudas chasam, ve'eno mesamcho over beheikolos. I like to understand that in the following way. A person's nehena misudas I like marriage. Marriage is a great idea. Great institution. I'm the hen of Misudas Chasson. I like the idea of marriage. So fine, then do something about it. You have a chance to be Misamech, this Chasson and Kala, so be Misamech them. Get involved. Don't make it theoretical. It's a nice idea. Fine, so do something. Strengthen them. 
But on the hand of Mishud HaSchosen, you like the idea. The Eino Masamcha, but you don't get involved. So you're over Behei Kolos. You're basically ignoring the purpose of why that institution exists, because you're not getting involved personally. So therefore, you can't just be an Ohev Shalom. You have to also be a Rodev Shalom. You have to pursue it practically, do something about it. If you like the idea, don't sit back and just pontificate about it. Do something. There's another idea, though, of Ohev Shalom and Rodev Shalom. The Mefar Shemesh, the word Rodev, usually is pursuing somebody to hurt them, to chase them away, to get rid of them. That's a Rodev. So what's Rodev Shalom? Sometimes being peaceful is not going to bring perfection to the world. Ein shalom, omer Hashem Wicked people who want to destroy the perfection of the world, strengthening them and being at peace with them is not shalom. It's the opposite of shalom. Neville Chamberlain wanted to be a peacemaker, right? enabled Hitler to do what he did. Had he not been such a great peacemaker and made pieces of Adolf Hitler, then maybe the world would be a better place. So sometimes you can't just be an Ohev Shalom to really love perfection. Sometimes you have to be a Rodev Shalom. You have to pursue it to destroy it, where you have to make machlokas, and you have to pursue people who would want to destroy the perfection of the world. If that sounds very radical, I'll give you two Misholim, very relevant to this week's Sedra. But let's start with Dovid HaMelech. Dovid HaMelech was told by Nosan Hanavi that he could not build the base of Mikdash because his hands were bloodied with all the wars that he made. But Shlomo HaMelech, who was a man of peace, as his name represents, no wars, he never fought any battles, he could build the Beis HaMikdash, which is a house of peace. Yet the Medrash says just the opposite. The Medrash says, David HaMelech, I can't let you build the Beis HaMikdash, because if you build the Beis HaMikdash, it'll be eternal. And I can't, at this point in history, have an eternal Beis HaMikdash. I have to have the option that if Cloud Yisrael sin, I can destroy the Beis HaMikdash in place of destroying them. Shofach, but if you build it, it's going to be eternal. I won't have that option. I'll have to destroy the Jewish people. So at this point in history, we can't have an eternal Beis HaMikdash. But your son Shlomo, he'll be to build a Beis HaMikdash that can be destroyed. So we'll let him build it. I seems from the psukim that David HaMelech couldn't build it because he was negative. He had his hands full of blood. Now, whose blood was on the hands of David HaMelech? The blood of Rishoyim. He destroyed Rishoyim. He brought perfection to the world. That kind of perfection is an aggressive perfection. That kind of perfection can build an eternal Beis HaMikdash. Shlomo HaMelech just had a passive perfection. He never had any wars. That kind of passive perfection can't build an eternal Beis HaMikdash. So peace is not necessarily sitting by and let everybody live and let live, do your own thing, that's not peace. That's copping out on your responsibility in this world. Another example, this week said, Pinchas ben Eloza ben Aaron HaKohen, Hei Shivis HaMosib ben Yisrael, Lochein Emor, Hineni Nosein Lo Brisi Shalom. What does Pinchas get as his reward? Brisi Shalom. Why? Because he was such a peaceful person, right, who murdered two people, right, and, and held their body like on a, a spit. Right? He was such a peaceful person, Pinchas. So he gets the, the os covered of Shalom. But that's Shalom. Because if Pinchas didn't do what he did, then the Jewish people could have been destroyed. It would have been the opposite of perfection by destroying these two Rishoyim, by standing up for what was right, 
Pinchas brought perfection to the Jewish people, and he was blessed with brisi shalom, eternal shalom. Therefore, sometimes, for the sake of perfection, sometimes you have to chase away some people. You can't be the nice guy, right, and uh, let everybody do whatever they want to do. If you want the Torah to be like this, fine, we'll make it like this. You want the Torah to be like that, we'll make it like that. And unfortunately, there are people in Kiruv who think their purpose is to reform the Torah. They're not reform Jews. They call themselves Orthodox Jews. My Rosh Hashiva said he's not an Orthodox Jew. He's a Torah observant Jew. Orthodox is a word that comes from the Greek. The Greeks were not necessarily Orthodox Jews. So uh, people who claim to be Orthodox but use methods, they think that they're helping Cloud Yisrael by permitting people to do things that are totally not sanctioned by the Torah or by the Rabbana Shalom, and they're fixing up the world. They are being Makariv Klal Yisrael, and it's easier to Makariv people. You tell them to do whatever you want to do. Makariv people tell them they have to keep mitzvahs, and they have to keep the mitzvahs the way the Rabbana Shalom wants them to keep them, not the way they want to keep them. So that's very difficult. It's hard to get people to change their ways, but they don't have to change their ways. You be what you want to be, and that's the Torah. We'll make the Torah fit you. That's not shalom, that's the opposite of shalom. So sometimes you have to be a rodef shalom. You have to know when it's impossible. I'm not the arbiter of the Torah. I don't have the right to make my own decisions of what Torah is. And therefore, sometimes I have to throw up my hands and say, like a doctor says sometimes, I can't cure the patient. A doctor, at least some doctors at least, admit that sometimes they're not all powerful. There's things they can't do. That's the way the world is. In the spiritual world, is the same thing. Sometimes a person has to say, I would love to be matter this aguna. I would love to help this person, but I can't. According to the rules the Rabbanu Shalom gave, just like the same rules the Rabbanu Shalom gave in nature, I'm helpless. <coughs> I can't change the rules. I can't change the the laws of nature either. So sometimes you have to be not only an Ohev Shalom, you have to be a Rodev Shalom too, with one condition, that you always have to have the desire to do it, even though sometimes you can't. By Yaakov Avinu, it says that um, he was punished, that his daughter was attacked by Shem. Because he refused to let Dina marry Esau. He, he hid her away for fear that Esau would see her and want to marry her. And maybe she would be mashpia on her uncle and turn him into a balchuva. Kiruv. The obvious question is, that's how we make Shaduchim? You have a daughter, fine base Yaakov girl. Right? And she really has power of persuasion and kir she's a great Kiruv person. So uh, you want to marry her off. So you go to the Tel Aviv bus station, find some guy who's uh, drugged up, drunk, a bum on the street, kick him and tell him, listen, I got a great girl for you. Maybe she'll turn you into some tzaddik. It's absurd. What was the time on Yaakov Avinu? Says the altar from Slabotka. Yaakov Avinu had to hide away his daughter. He couldn't take the risk of maybe Esau being mashpia on little Dina instead of Dina being mashpia on Uncle Esau. But when he knocked the nails in the box, he did it with a little too much gusto. He should have been crying. I wish I could be mashpia on my brother. I wish I could take the risk, but I'm not allowed to. But the desire is there. That's how a person has to be. I wish I could be Makar of the whole world. I wish I could help this person who has a very serious halachic problem. But I can't change the Torah. But I feel bad that I can't. Somebody once told me, Rabbi Uri from Los Angeles, Zechot Tzadik Livrocha, 
told me a story Reb Shimon Schwab learned in the mirror. And he came from Germany. So every once a year he went home, Pesach time. And he was preparing, uh, was, Pesach was coming, and Rabbi Yeruchim, the Mashgiach in Mir, noticed that Rabbi Shimon Schwab wasn't getting ready to leave. So he went over, he said, aren't you going home for Pesach? You haven't been home for a year. He said, I would love to. My parents were supposed to send me money for the trip and it never came. So Rabbi Yeruchim said, what's the problem? I loan you the money. And when you come back, you'll pay me back. So he gave him the money. He went home, he came back, paid back the loan. And when he paid back the loan, he said, thank you, Rebbe. Bruchem said, what? You can't say thank you. It's Rebbe's devoted, right? You can't say thank you when you give back a loan. Okay. Next year, the same thing happened. Money didn't come and he had to go home. So again, he borrowed the money from Yeruchem, but this time he learned his lesson. And when he came back to give the back the money, he didn't say thank you. So Biruchim looked at him sternly and said, where's my thank you? He said, Rebbe, I don't understand. Last year I said thank you, you told me it's awesome. And now I didn't say thank you and you want to know where the thank you is. He said, yeah, you're not allowed to say thank you, but I should have seen that you wanted to, but you were prevented to because the halacha says you can't do it. But at least you should have wanted to say thank you. So sometimes you have to want to do something even if it's impossible to do, you can't do it. Feel bad, a doctor feels bad that he can't cure a patient. It's beyond his capabilities, but he feels bad about it. You know what the difference is? When he'll be able to cure a patient, he'll do it. If he doesn't care, if he's very um, um, insensitive, then even when you can do it, you won't do it. So you have to want to change the world, but you have to realize sometimes your hands are tied, but you have to want to do it. The tells the Rosh Hashiva of Elimeir blocks that's out. The Gemara says, La'olam te'idaito shal adam murevesim habrios. Person should always be social. Murevesim habrios. Rashi says there, La'asos kirtson ish va'ish. To do what everybody wants. He says, you can't do that, because sometimes this one wants this one, this one something else. You can't do what everybody wants. He says, it doesn't mean that you have to do what everybody wants. Sometimes you can't. But it means that when somebody asks you for something, your first initial reaction should be, why not? And then you have to think about it and see, maybe there is a reason why not. Most people, when somebody asks them for something, they say, why yes? Then they have to think about it to see, maybe yes, they can do it. So lasos, kirtson, ish, ish is not necessarily you have to do for everybody. You have to want to. That's your initial, same thing. You may not be able to make of the world. There are situations that you are not the balabas over and your hands are tied, but you have to at least want to. And then, oevis habrios. You have to realize that your shlemus depends on other people. And you love all the creations because they're part of you. It says Avram Avinu, hanefesh asher osu becharam. Always bothered me. He made a lot of converts. Should have said hanefosho asher osu. So the pat answer is, when it comes to ruchnius, everything is one. But it's not true. Because he's talking about goyim. Goyim doesn't have that achtus of nishamas. So why do you say hanefesh? I have two understandings, and they're both true. One is, if you're looking only to change the multitudes, you're not willing to get involved unless there's a lot of people involved, you'll never be successful with anyone. If you don't appreciate the importance of every individual, then you won't be successful. And if you appreciate the individual, you'll be successful with a lot of individuals. Avram Avinu Hanefesh, if it'll be one person, it was Kedai for him. Because that one person adds Shlemus to me, and that's the second shot. Hanefesh is not their Nefesh. He wasn't perfecting them. He was perfecting himself. Because the more imperfect people there are in the world, the more imperfect I am. So I'm concerned about my Nefesh. In order to have reach perfection, I have to help other people reach perfection. And I'm also concerned, therefore, about every individual. It's not numbers that make the difference. If numbers make a difference, we are outnumbered by the Chinese, I don't know how many times. So numbers, when it comes to Cloud Yisrael, lo atem ha-miut mikol ha-amin, lo mirubchem. It's not because of numbers that the Rabbanism chose us. 
So that is the prescription. You have to be mitamid of Aaron. You have to learn the tools. You have to learn the right hashkafas. You have to learn the right means by being a Talmud of Aaron and then apply it to Ohev Shalom and Rodev Shalom and Ohev Esabrios. And then, after all of that, Mekarvan la Torah. Then you can talk and really be Mekarv people to the Torah. And sometimes the Kiruv has to be very subtle. You can't do it and knock somebody over the head and think you're going to make them from in uh, two minutes because you're going to tell them that if they don't, they're going to go to Gehenna and you better change your ways or whatever. That's not the way you be care of people. Sometimes that's to be very subtle. It says that Noah didn't have children until he was 500, so no, none of his children should be bar mitzvah. In those days, bar mitzvah was 100. That's when you became a bar mitzvah. Children shouldn't be bar mitzvah when the, when the mabel came. Why? Because if they would be rishoyim, they would be judged on their own, they would be destroyed, it would be terrible for Noah. And if they beat tzaddikim, they'd have to build all those other tevas. Always bother me. Just because they're tzaddikim, why couldn't they fit into Noah's teva? They wouldn't be bigger, right? Why, why would they have to build their own tevas? But one of the reasons why Noah had to build a teva is because he couldn't go and give Musr to the generation, they would have killed him. They would have ignored him. What a rock would have, would have signed. The world's coming to an end. The flood is coming. They would have laughed at him. So what did Noah do? He built a teva in his backyard for 120 years. And people saw he really meant it. And they came to him and they said, Noah, what are you building over here? It's a little bit big for your bathtub. And he said, there's no water around here. He said, there was going to be a lot of water if you guys don't do tshuva. So he had a way of having a conversation with them. And it started with a model that this guy really means it. He's working 120 years building this boat. He must really believe that this is going to happen. Sometimes the hashpa is not in what you say. It's what you do, what your personal example is. It has to be very subtle. And therefore, if Noah's children were of bar mitzvah age, a hundred, they'd have to build their own tevas to fulfill that mitzvah of tochacha. They'd have to do it personally, not just be yotze with Noah's. So, Emir Hashem, if we take this seriously and you follow the prescription of Hillel, Talmidov Shalaron, Oev Shalom, Rodev Shalom, Oev Sabrios, and then Mekarvan La Torah, then we'll see the day that will be very successful. And Eliyah Novi will come. The Heishiv Levavos Sabonim, the Levonim Alavosam, will come to the time when this period of the year will turn from Avelis and Sora to Sason, the Simcha, the Yomim Tovim, the Meir of Yomim.